This meeting is now being recorded and will be uploaded to the Town of Amherst YouTube channel by the Information Technology Department. Fabulous. Thank you, Angie. Uh, so I want to call the meeting of the Jones Library Building Committee to order. We are meeting virtually pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. And I'm going to ask each of you uh, to register your presence vocally so we know that you are hearing us and that you can be heard. Sharon, Sherry. Here. Sean. Here. Alex Lefebvre. Here. Paul Bockelman. Here. Christine. Here. George. George Hicks. Here. Good. And we are joined by two distinguished colleagues from uh, Colliers, uh, Ken Guyette and Greg DiCarlo, and I'm Austin Sarrett, and I am here. Okay. So the first item of business is the approval of the minutes of the March 15th meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Thank you, Paul. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, any corrections to the minutes? Uh, Austin, or uh, Mr. Chairman, there was one that I saw on page one. What is uh, the problem? And that is um, the line that reads, uh, DeCarlo spoke about his experience with public buildings and his extensive experience on uh, library projects. And I wish I had that extensive experience on library projects, but I do not. I just didn't want the record to show that. So, uh, wow. so we will correct the minutes by deleting extens extensive experience in library projects. Is that what you were saying? Yes, that would work. Okay, thank you for that, Chris. Okay, anything else on the minutes? Okay, uh, we'll vote on the minutes, signify that you approve the minutes as amended. Yes or no, if you don't, Sharon, Sherry. Yes. Thank you, Sean. Yes. Alex Lafayette. Yes. Paul Bachman. Yes. Christine. Yes. George. Yes. And Austin votes yes, uh, with great appreciation to Angie. Okay, next item three, the financial update. Sean, how are we doing? Well, I'll show you how we're doing. That's Let's fabulous. See. All right, so just because this is the one visual I have right now for you guys. Yep. Yep. Um, this is our, the MBLC grant payments. So, Again, Sharon gets these every month from our yep. treasurer collector who, uh, as a requirement of this grant, we have to have a separate account set up for the MBLC money. Um, so we continue to bring in a little bit of interest each month that uh, we'll add. And when we get the next MBLC payment, you know, it'll all, it'll all grow exponentially faster. Um, and then the other financial update I have is that um, a meeting with the financial advisor and our bond council on oh. Thursday and hope to um, make a final determination on how we're gonna finance um, the library project. So hopefully between now and the next meeting, we'll, we can update you on sort of the, the approach. And again, that's just whether we're gonna borrow this year or wait to borrow um, until next year. But um, that's the goal of that meeting on Thursday is to finalize that. Just for the record, and for those of us that don't know, who could you name our financial advisor and could you name the bond council? Yeah, so our financial advisor is David Eisenthal. He's been with the town, I think, over 30 years. He's been with us for a very long time. Um, he works for Unibank, um, and he advises us on all matters relating to debt and borrowing. Um, okay. And our bond council is Rick Manley. Let me know if I'm, I might be mispronouncing mis, uh, the last name. Um, he has also been the bond counsel for quite some time. Um, I think he works for Lock and Lord, technically. Um, and they are the ones that will uh, tell us everything we need to have in place in order to do a successful borrowing. Wonderful. Great. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Any questions about the financial update? Great. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Item four in our agenda is um, a report from Colliers. So Ken or Craig, Greg, Ken, Craig, Ken. <laughs> I could take that. So we are still kind of uh, 
at this point right now has a, a little bit of a holding pattern waiting for the time where we can um, uh, bring a design team on board. Uh, once that gets gets uh, off, uh, then we can really start to ramp up our efforts on um, getting a schedule put together, getting that locked in, start really working towards those milestones and uh, getting some uh, designer meetings um, scheduled right away to get them uh, back up to speed and to get the uh, the the current set of construct uh, constru um, concept drawings out again for a um, a revised uh, estimate to see where we're at um, overall on the, on the numbers at this point. Where are we with FAA? Well, that produced silence. Good. <laughs> so I um, I think the goal is to at least review the proposal today. Um, as long as there's no issues with it being public, Ken, and from your end, but um, I think we were going to review that proposal and possibly vote on it or vote to authorize the town manager to um, move forward with it. So, do you have uh, it to share, Ken, or which I've got it if you'd like? Uh, if you've got mine, Sean, that, that has my markups, that's fine. I can, yeah. I can find it as well. Okay. So the one dated February 24th, correct? Correct. So Sean, could you just, um, so what, what I'm hoping we'll be able to do is to vote to approve this and to therefore authorize the, the committee authorizes you and the town manager to enter into a contract with FAA. How does it go? Yeah, so I mean, technically the building committee is overseeing this project and the, and the resources related to this project. So um, I think there's different variations of what we can do, but I think the what I would recommend at this point would be to authorize the town manager to move forward with this proposal and, and sign a um, contract extension or a contract amendment. Um, this, this is, you'll, as we go through this, this proposal essentially builds upon the existing contract we yeah. have with FFA, FAA to say, all right, here's the next phase of the project. Here's what we're gonna do um, and here's what it'll cost. So let's look at this proposal. Ken, do you wanna walk us through the proposal or Sean, do you wanna walk us through the proposal, Ken? I'll let Ken I, do that. Just tell me where to scroll, Ken. Yeah, I can walk through. You can just start scrolling, uh, Sean. So uh, obviously we've gone back and forth several times with FAA on this to, to get them uh, to, to give us a number that was uh, appropriate and actually fit with the budget. Uh, it took some doing. Um, they had, uh, you know, as you can imagine, they were really um, looking to put, kind of put quite a, quite a fee against this project. and. Uh, and we've been able to talk them down pretty significantly. So right here is their, their consultant team, which again, includes the same people that they were using earlier, um, as far as uh, you know, structural engineering and landscape design and acoustics, et cetera. Cost estimator was Fennessy. They were the ones that have been doing the cost estimating right along. So no big surprises here. Uh, and then they start going through kind of specifically what their scope of work is gonna be as we work our way through the proposal. Uh, some of the phase durations and scopes of work. So these are the phase durations we gave them as kind of an outline on what, what to figure. So schematic design will be about two months, et cetera, et cetera. And they outline their, their scope of work and their, their scope of work generally is uh, again, appropriate for, for this project and for the work that they're gonna be doing um, to complete and complete the, the construction documents and put this out to bid. Um, they do outline some meetings, you know, obviously they want to make sure that we keep the meetings uh, under control as best we can. And that's something that we're all going to have to work on together um, because, uh, you know, I think I think the, the general sense is, is is that could really get out of control very, very quickly if we're if we're not mindful of it. And that that's a, that's a big cost um, for their firm, obviously, with them coming from where they're coming from to get out here for for meetings, et cetera. So we just need to be mindful of that. And so. They made sure that they included some of the meetings that uh, they, they felt were appropriate during each phase. And ultimately, the bottom line is, is there are certain things that um, that were scopes of work that may or may not be necessary for the project that we told them to just pull those scopes of work out for now and and have a dollar, dollar value assigned to those. And if at the time we need to break, pull the trigger on those scopes of work, we have some budget savings right now based on where this proposal landed and we'll be able to pull the trigger on, on that right now. But I, we did not want to encumber that money immediately coming out of the gate. Um, 
understanding that it may not be be totally necessary for them to be able to to do that scoping. Could you go back? Could you go back to the meetings that you just sure. showed? So, uh, these are the meetings that are assumed in the first phase of the work. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. So let's just say it out loud. So there are six uh, uh, potential meetings with the building committee, and those meetings might include uh, meetings that might be arranged with the outreach subcommittee. And the department meetings, just again, what departments would they, uh, can at this, phase, at this phase be meeting with likely? They might meet with the building department. They might meet with uh, the, you know, the zoning planning, things of that nature, just to, to give right. them a, an overview. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And it's when the same thing with the design development, et cetera. Um, you know, they've got the meetings outlined um, and understanding that there's going to be times where um, we may end up having um, discussions without their participation because it's stuff that's off, off topic from them anyway. So they wouldn't have to necessarily attend certain meetings, potentially, say, for the outreach committee, et cetera, yep. things of that nature. Um, so we want to make sure that we outline that the construction document phase is about 20 weeks. And so they've outlined that scope of work as well. And uh, again, um, the, the scopes of work that that we uh, had asked them to pull, if you continue down, Sean, I just want to go through that really quick. Bidding and negotiating at eight weeks, that may be a little long, but um, you know, at this point, it's fine to keep it at that point. We want to try to shorten that if we can. And then construction administration is. Whoa, uh, whoa, 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 go, go back up one thing. Just so again, just so I understand the 75% and 100% submit 75% construction documents, submit 100% construction. What, what, what is that? Mean? What is the 75% construction document? Mean? So we want to do an, a cost estimate check at 75% of construction documents. Again, before this goes out on the street to bid just to allow us enough time to make any last minute changes to uh, if there's some some surprise out there in the market um, that allows us to do that. And the 100% construction documents are basically the bid set bid of document. documents ready to go out. That's and is correct. this is this, uh, is this kind of industry standard? You do it at 75%? It is, uh, you know, with the uh, Mass School Building Authority, they actually do two. They do one at 50% construction documents and then one at 95% construction documents. Uh, that's not typically necessary okay. for, for most projects, but this is the industry, kind of the industry standard. Okay. And if we continue down the 83 weeks or 18 months for construction administration, we feel that that's uh, appropriate at this point. Um, we wanna make sure that we're, we're, we're being very diligent about um, keeping the contractor on, on point with getting this project done timely. And so we're, we're hopeful that that's gonna be um, Again, all uh, we think that that's uh, appropriate. Um, their proposed fee, if we continue down, so they have their proposed fee broken out by the phases that they um, discuss up above. And I put in red kind of our, our budget numbers. So their total fee was $2.725 million. Their original fee for this scope of work was $2.9 million. And so there's about a $225,000 difference from their first iteration to this one. And again, that was that difference was um, by not only trying to, um, again, put the pressure on them to get their numbers more in line with industry standard, what we felt were industry standard, and also a couple of those, again, small uh, ticket items that were that were pulled out and left as, as uh, additional services if required. Um, so as you can see, the budget number that we are currently holding in the budget is 2.688 million uh, with $143,000 for consultant reimbursables. This proposal that we see here includes consultant reimbursables. So our total budget is 2.831 million for um, construction documents and design phase services. And that ends up equaling about $106,000 difference from the budget. So we are currently for the design phase services for FAA are about $106,000 under budget if this proposal were to be accepted at this point. 
and just so everybody knows, one of the things I look at um, for our, uh, our designer fees is that it should be around 10% of construction. Sometimes it's a little higher, sometimes it's a little lower. Um, and so, you know, working with Ken, that was one of the things that, you know, we looked and this is, it's, I think it's slightly, when you add in the, uh, it's, it's slightly, All the add it's, it's a, yeah, when you add in the alternates, it's slightly above, but it's, um, but it's very close to that 10%. So at this point, we would we would love to be able to um, get FAA under contract and allow them to proceed at this point. Um, with the you're, you're, you're muted, Austin. You're muted, Austin. What I said then was very wise. <laughs> now I'm going to speak. Uh, Ken, I just want you to make want to make sure that everybody understands the original budget for this project contemplated 2.831 as the designer fee and the construct and the consultant reimbursement. That was our original budget. That's correct. Right. So the original budget was those two numbers, 2688 plus 143 for 2831. Fabulous. And then Ken, it says the above fee is negotiable. Yeah, so that 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 negotiation has happened so okay. um, <laughs> several times. So I'm I am I am um, certain that it is no longer negotiable, even though they, they forgot to strike that from the proposal. Okay, but I want to just also be clear that the committee is not contemplating any more negotiations with FAA. That is done. Right. If I can. But the town manager still can negotiate with FAA. The town manager ultimately okay. has to sign the contract. And one question yep. I have for the committee is that it it uh, presumes in-person meetings and virtual meetings. Yep. And there's value to both of those um, things to the um, design team. I don't know what the design team's preferences are, but I, I would like to know where the the building committee is if you feel strongly about having in-person meetings where there's, there's a cost involved with people traveling to a location as opposed to virtual means and do you have a strong does the committee care a whole lot about that or not thank you for that question angie could you take down or or sean could you take down the screen share for a minute thank you so uh what do people think do you want to put in the budget that Paul is going to negotiate the contract. Do you want to put in uh, any provision for in-person meetings? So, so let me clarify. There are provisions for, for in-person meetings and virtual yeah. meetings. Yeah, yeah. And I guess in terms of having this conversation, it would just be helpful to the committee to know we're fine meeting virtually. We're going to do that. Or we really want to maximize the number of in-person meetings that it, 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 it pres presumes a certain number of in-person meetings. And is the, I guess the question to the committee is, are you okay if we negotiate some of that away for some other benefit? Yeah, so the question is, do you wanna have, what's in the, in the proposal now is some in-person meetings. Do you wanna retain those in-person meetings? Is that the question? Yes. Okay, Christine and then Sharon. Um, so in the brief overview that I saw of the document, they sort of have a breakdown and it looked reasonable. I think there's value to having both. Um, and I understand you save a lot of money by having the Zoom ones. Uh, and the only thing I would ask is when we do have the online ones uh, that we could definitely get the information as much as possible. It's gonna be shown at the meeting beforehand because then we either have right. it to look at or we've already looked at it because that is one of the drawbacks on the, on the remote, like trying to see the screen, you can't like control it yourself. Anyways, that was... Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christine. Sharon? Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, so if you want to negotiate further, I would be happy as long as we can see them once per phase in person. Um, I I'm happy for the rest to be virtual. It's funny, four years ago, I would have said no way, it's all going to be in person. But now I, I think we're very capable of, of understanding what's going on, you know, and through the computer screen. Sean? So I guess, Paul, it's a question for you. So after, I don't know if it's July or whatever date the, the governor's order goes away, our meetings will no longer be virtual, right? Our meetings will have to take place in person. So 
so what they're proposing is not necessarily virtual meetings they're theoretically it'll be virtual attendance for them but we will be in person and seeing them on a screen um, and interacting with them that way yeah so it's unclear what will happen after july um because you know there is a push for legislation to continue to let people to meet remotely it's very popular among local officials um and you're right it it's really about their attendance versus us being present and you know we have been conducting town council meetings in a hybrid mode you know we would if we are meeting in person it would at this moment in time we would have to meet in, in the town council the town room because that's the only one with the technology set up to accommodate that so yeah it, it's if it's technically feasible clearly we can't arrange for something that's not technically or legally allowed great thank you alex before i call on you just uh, sharon and sean just as a matter of take down your hands if you don't want to be recognized again thank you um alex yeah i guess i just wanted a little clarity um are all of these meetings they all sound like building committee meetings and from an outreach perspective are we contemplating that some of these community outreach subcommittee meetings or building committee meetings would be community forums or is any kind of public engagement charrette whatever it winds up being with the architects in addition to so I just wanted to understand that a little bit before responding on in person or not in person mm -hmm. okay. I, think the, I think the intent is to, is to just try to keep it manageable right they, they just don't want to have to be able to be out here you know two three times a week uh, for the entirety of the design phase uh, they want it to be, uh, you know, appropriate. So if we can have some sort of mix of the virtual and the in-person, I think that would be, we'd be able to find a, a happy medium there. Um, they just didn't want to get burnt by having just too, too many meetings being out there. And uh, I think there is a value to having in-person meetings with the design team at certain points of the design, obviously, that makes the most sense. And that's what, that's kind of, what we're trying to do because originally they had more virtual than in person and we we pushed to push back on them to get more in person meetings um to be to, you know be in that proposal so i don't know alex did that answer your question no but not at try, all um sorry, ahead. Ken. try again <laughs> so go ahead sorry i i did a poor job of asking the question um to the extent that we are going to involve the public in certain decisions or in certain input and feedback are we contemplating the architects participate and if so does this schedule of meetings include that or is it in addition to so i, I think it we would need to have the architects participate in some of those sessions uh, i don't think all of them i think there's um, a majority of the questions we'd be able to answer uh, as the opm uh, and, and i think it would be appropriate to have those types of public forums in person um, and not have the design team necessarily be remote to those because they're going to be, um, you know, of, of a design overview nature. So the, the design team would want to be there to be able to present that as well in person. And those are those are included in this. You know, they understand that there's going to be a certain amount of outreach. They just want to understand that it's going to be, again, um, you know, something that's manageable for them. Alex, is that? Yeah, so then I guess I want to come back to Sharon, who wanted to make sure we had an in-person meeting once per phase. And where where does that leave you? I mean, obviously we're not gonna. I don't I don't know the process yet to know how often it makes sense. I feel I feel like I'm I'm trying to answer questions I don't understand fully yet in terms of how we engage the architects when we are involving community feedback. So. I don't know what's appropriate. I don't know whether we only need one meeting with the architects and that's it. So I, I have to sort of rely on others to say, if we go to one per phase, that works for Sharon's questions as well as whatever's needed for public engagement. Uh, Paul Bachman. Yeah, so, so I think the, my, the, the, my question was more um, uh, the appetite for the committee, like how strongly do you feel about being in person versus not in person? Good. Some Good. committees feel very strongly they want to be in person. Some committees feel the world works on virtual. I can live without virtual. We've budgeted a certain number of in-person meetings and virtual meetings. And the question was, are, do we sort of have that balance right? It's sort of a, a two in person to every four virtual sort of roughly that. I mean, if, you know, if there's value to the architect to say, hey, We'll give you a couple more virtual if you take away one of those in person because there's two hours travel each way, whatever it is. 
that's some value to them maybe. So this, that was the sort of scope of the question. I think right. we all recognize the need for in-person. Once we're able to do that um, with the public, it will be very valuable. So Paul, it would be helpful just to recap. So just remind us, Ken, how many in-person meetings, how many virtual meetings in the schematic phase? Ken? Do you want me to answer that, Austin? Sean, I was just getting to <laughs> the right. uh, That's fine. Sean? Um, so there's one meeting with the MBLC. Yep. There's two in-person meetings with the building yep. committee and four virtual meetings with the building committee. That's in the first phase. In the, in the schematic phase. And then yep. there's also two in-person meetings with departments and one virtual meeting with departments. How about with, the, how about with just focus on the committee for the moment? Just the building committee. So there's six yep. total, two in-person, four virtual. Yep. And how about in the next phase? Eight. And, yep. Uh, eight and how many? Three in-person, five virtual. Yep. And beyond that? And then in construction seven. documents, yeah, seven. And how's that? Five virtual. So Paul, I'll say for myself that um, I wonder whether or not we could keep the balance what as is proposed in this um, document. Um, it, it Part of me isn't sure what the answer is gonna be about in-person because while I love, I love Zoom, I, I wonder whether we're gonna wanna say, gee, that we had a Zoom meeting, but that didn't work for that didn't work for us. So I wonder whether it's possible to negotiate this, which keeps this number, which would be um, if I did my homework about seven in-person meetings on 14 Zoom meetings. Uh, that's a third in person, more or less. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts about in-person versus Zoom? Alex. Yeah, I'm, I understood the question that was being asked, and I actually don't have a problem with virtual meetings. The only, from my perspective, time potentially I wanted to make sure we had meetings was it was when we were doing community outreach to the extent that we would have all the architects. So that's why I was asking that question. But as a building yeah. committee, I'm fine virtually. Yeah, yeah. And presumably, again, Alex, some of these in-person meetings that are with the building committee, we might use for subcommittees, in particular, the outreach. Okay, I got Sharon. Yeah, what, uh, so one more question. So uh, I'm assuming that this doesn't prevent us or, you know, how we were talking about there, there are many special interests uh, having to do with this. And there are several different groups of people who would love some one-on-one -on -one time with the architects. There, there's nothing here preventing us, them, from reaching into our pockets, their pockets. I don't know which pocket, but paying them more to come out for a special meeting with whatever group. Does that make sense? Yeah, except the paying them more part. I mean, yeah. well, I mean, that's I, well, one thing they, we can. Sorry, go ahead, Tom. I think they budget $2,000 per meeting for an in person meeting. But, and so, so it's I, not, I, so I it's not free. Because, no, it's definitely not free, and nor, sh nor should it be. But uh, um, I want to I use examples, uh, and I'm going to use the example of the Civil War tablets. I know that. Um, the, there's a group of interested people that are really interested in seeing specifically what this can look like. And um, I, I'm not sure that that will end up being one of our chosen most important um, uh, meetings that we are approving right now. Does that make sense? So as I understand what Paul has asked, it's Meetings are scarce goods, they, they consume resources. And the question is, do we think that the balance of in-person and Zoom is right so far? And I think we've got to be careful with what we are going to do with these meetings. And we'll rely on Craig and Ken to give us some guidance about this is the kind of meetings that typically are had and you don't want to waste them on this or that. Uh, not that the, the meetings about the Civil War tablets or anybody else, any other group would be a waste, but it's going to consume resources. Paul? 
yeah, I mean, like, uh, uh, this is a good good guidance. I think the, the only question might be, would would we want to trade two virtual meetings? Is there an equivalency of two virtual meetings equals one in-person meeting type thing? Can we gain some time that way? But that's a conversation to be had. It just, but it sounds like what the, what the committee is saying is that they want to balance between in-person versus virtual. I've heard some people say virtual for committee meetings is fine. Meeting with other people, constituencies, it might be better to have in person because that might be there might in the in the public there might be more value there if we're able to meet in public. So um, I just want to understand, Paul, and and again, Sean and Craig can get this straight. You're entering into an, uh, an agreement with them. Does that commit us if we were to decide we don't want to meet with you in person? Would the the fact that we'd signed a contract which Im imagined that number of in-person meetings, Craig? So um, in, in my experience, so I haven't um, spoken directly with Feingold, um, Alexander about this, but in my experience, architects, as Ken alluded to, they put those in there kind of as a um, a limit. And if if you go one meeting over or one of the virtual ones, we say, hey, we really want to have it in person. My experience is that architects are agreeable to that. They just don't want to have, you know, 500 meetings. So, um, and then as um, Sharon pointed out, if we get to a point and we say, geez, we've kind of exhausted our meeting allotment, they've already given us one or two freebies, we really want, say, another series of four meetings, that's something we could easily say, um, Feingold, you know, give us an at, um, additional services proposal and they'll say, all right, yeah, for another four meetings, you know, $8,000, as, uh, as Paul was mentioning, they, they have in their mind kind of a unit cost. And then we can say, all right, it's important for us to have these meetings. It's worth the X number of dollars. Paul, do you have what you were looking for? I do, thank you. So is there any other comment about the proposal? And then if um, there is no other comment about the proposal, I take it that what we want to do is we want to have a motion to recommend to the town manager that he negotiates with FAA on the basis of this proposal. So are there any other comments on the proposal, questions about the proposal? Alex. Yeah, um, I guess I thought I saw something, but maybe I didn't around sustainability um, that might have been an add on. Not sure if I saw that or not. Um, but I know that we are 106,000 under budget right now, which so I guess I just wanted to. I'm okay adding that back on as long as that's a possibility, you know, depending on how. Yeah, Austin is okay if I speak to that. Absolutely sure. Yeah, so there's a few recommended additional services. Um, I'll just share my screen so you can see it. It's probably Thank you. Simply that way. So um, to what Alex pointed out, the life cycle assessment, mm -hmm. um, it would be a cost of $10,000 more. Um, further studies of energy conservation measures would be $15,000 more. Um, and I think this is what, what Paul was alluding to, this section about Yep. Um, architectural permitting and they're charged saying it would be $2,000 um, per meeting. Then we have some civil and landscape permitting services that they can provide between forty dollars and $50,000 and then photo realistic renderings at 2000 per image. So um, I, I think we'll rely on the OPM to guide us, um, you know, which ones we need to execute with FAA and if these prices are reasonable um, or if some of these can be done or if they recommend these be done elsewhere. Thank you, Sean. Alex, did that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Great. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about the proposal? Yeah, I guess, I guess so Alex just opened it up. And so, you know, the renderings, for example, our capital campaign committee is definitely gonna need the renderings. So is now the time, I guess I'm asking the OPM, John, is now the time to actually put this into the contract knowing full well, we're definitely gonna need it renderings or is it still gonna cost us two grand no matter whether we put it in the contract now or later, so it just doesn't matter. Craig. So uh, with renderings, renderings is a broad category of kind of uh, product. Uh, 
Feingold may have uh, very simple three-dimensional drawings that they can provide, which they wouldn't consider rendering and just taking something that they're working on and giving it to us. Uh, but my, my impression is when they put that down there, they mean for the photorealistic renderings, that's what they'd be charging for. And so when it comes time, we can see, all right, what can we get for, you know, no added cost? And they'll show it to us. And if it's good enough, great. And if we want something more, then we can decide to uh, pay extra for it. Okay. And so what about the life cycle assessment that Alex was just asking about? Is it worth putting the 10 grand in there so they can budget their time? They know they're going to do it. Now, I had seen in um, some of the um, information that was posted on the project website that they'd already done some of that life cycle assessment. So I suspect what they're talking about is doing a full report. Um, and that's another one. I, I think we, we see how much information they're willing to include um, for this base fee. And then if we say we really want more, then we can uh, talk about it, make that decision at that, at that point in time. Sean? Yeah, and so we, I mean, all these these rates, you know, they can be sort of appended to the contract, added to the contract so that we have them going forward. I think it's nice that we're under budget on this element of the project, but we have to keep in mind there's that larger piece of this too. So when we think about adding things on, we should probably wait to see what the, um, get a better sense of where we're gonna land with the full project. Thank you, Sean. Okay, any other questions about the FAA proposal and the fee. So hearing none, I wonder if someone would move that we um, accept this proposal and recommend to the town manager that he enter into negotiations for a contract with FAA. Can I do it? Can I do it? I'm excited to make this motion, please. Yes. So moved. <laughs> Is there a second to Sharon's excitement? A second. George, George, okay. Can I just offer a friendly amendment? Uh, is it gonna is it gonna bring Sharon down? No, no, no. I just want to okay, be clear that so we're not entering into a new contract with them. We are extending good. an existing um, contract with them. Thank you for that. Recommending to the town manager that he extend the existing contract. Good. All right. Are we ready to vote? Sharon, Sherry. Yes. Fabulous. Sean. Yes. Thank you, Sean. Paul? Yes. Uh, George? Yes. Christine? Yes. Alex? Yes. And Austin votes yes. And I just want to say, I have goosebumps. <laughs> it does, I just have the sense of, I know what Moses felt when he saw the promised land over the horizon. So. FAA, don't blow it. So um, we're looking forward to what the result will be of the town manager's um, work with FAA and looking forward to getting on with the work that they will do. And again, incredibly grateful for all the work that they've done to this point. Okay, Colliers, do you have anything else you want to say? Uh, no, sir. Thank you. That was, that was, that was pretty fabulous. Okay. Subcommittee reports. Christine for the design subcommittee. We have uh, not met since um, this group last met, so there's nothing to report in our packet. There were some draft minutes, but they have not been approved yet. We meet again on Friday, April 8th at 9 a.m. That will be online. Thank you very much, Christine. Okay, Alex for the outreach committee, subcommittee. Uh, so we met again on March 22nd, um, and we reviewed sort of the past public input that was provided for the design feasibility uh, initial schematic round. Um, we also looked a little bit at the fixed elements, you know, the location, the building program, the approximate square footage. We reviewed what those building program elements are. Um, and we talked about setting a first meeting, um, or not meeting, I guess a first community event, um, possibly for Sunday, May 1st, between 11 and 12. Um, the discussions around the meeting were to provide um, an introduction to the committee, the process, what the community can expect. 
um, but then to also set up different tables um, around the library um, to reintroduce the public to the project, ask questions, get excited. Um, also making it an event where the community is able to talk to um, the building committee, to library staff, to trustees, but also talking to each other about the project. Um, and also using it as sort of a gauge for who shows up and who doesn't to help us sort of identify um, what audience, you know, didn't initially show up to this that we might need to reach a little differently. Um, and so um, two things, one, um, wanted to make sure that that date works for folks. Um, the reason that date was chosen was we wanted to do something on a weekend and we also wanted the library to be able to provide childcare for people through programming through the um, the uh, children's uh, youth programming so that people could come drop their kids off at something fun and go hit the tables that they want to hit. Um, so that was what gave us the date, um, but I think the hope is that we've got the building committee people showing up, so I guess I want to make sure that that works and then also we had talked about getting something back from the OPM and Craig this was before you about some clear definitions, whether it's coming from the architect, the OPM about the process to buy that date, to be able to clearly explain to the community, the process, the dates and what they'll be able to weigh in on or not weigh in on and to have, you know, make sure that that's a reasonable date to have those clear conversations. Um, so that was the bulk of, yes, yeah, so that was the bulk of our meeting. Um, and then there was one other question about um, coming back to this committee around the intent of our charge, um, their specific language about us making recommendations to the design committee. And I think there was, uh, the last part says, uh, what does it say? Um, not to put to that, what is it? Oh, it says, yeah, the focus of the outreach committee shall be to inform the community, seek community engagement and make design recommendations to the design subcommittee. So I think there was a little bit of clarity that was desired by the uh, subcommittee on what design recommendations means. Are we collecting, filtering, are we just, what, what does that mean? What does this group uh, intend by that? So, and then our next meeting is April 5th um, at four o'clock. So those are all the Okay, things. so let's, let's hold the question about the, the charge, which is right, a very good question, and let's let's talk about the meeting that Alex was talking about. Uh, Craig, uh, yes. So um, one of the things I saw in those prior meeting minutes was that uh, request for information about what the public will be able to influence, and so, so I've been thinking about that, and I think um, it would be nice to collect as much information and recommendations as possible, not necessarily to limit so the public commentary to, all right, you can't affect X and you can't affect Y, but you can do A and B. I think it would actually be more most beneficial to sort of collect as much information as possible with the understanding that not everything people suggest is going to necessarily affect the building, but then uh, give you guys, the design subcommittee um, and the outreach group, also the opportunity to call through that information and say, all right, just for you know an example, we've collected 15 comments about a children's room. You know, a children's room is something that seems really important to like focus our attentions on. And I know you guys already have a program, so that's not necessarily the best um, example, but um, I think it would be tough. It and and limiting to say, all right, you can only we're only accepting comments on these aspects of the project. Um, I think it would be nice to sort of hear an unfiltered version of what the public thinks. Okay, other thoughts about this proposed meeting on the 1st of May. So uh, just so I'll be clear, if the, this, if the building committee shows up, do we have to notice it? And do we have to call this to order? Paul Bockelman? Come on, Paul. Well, Craig has an opinion on that. I, I, I think it doesn't hurt to ever post a meeting, honestly. Um, if you think you're going to get a quorum, it's going to be something that's going to be um, discussed by building committee members. If people are showing up just in the audience and not participating, that can be viewed differently. There is an opinion from our town a, a, a attorney on this type of thing. But Craig, I look to you also. Since you've Craig. Certainly. Uh, thank you. Uh, so in 
other communities, our standard recommendation is, yeah, post it like a public meeting. Um, if nothing else, it helps uh, get the word out for people who are looking. But uh, yeah, it just sort of covers you in case you happen to have a quorum um, so that there's no issues. I'm just trying to now imagine this. So you post it, we're outside, and then the, someone has to call the meeting to order? It just I'm just trying to get the feel of it. And I'm gonna need a much bigger gavel if we're outside. Yeah. <laughs> so in other communities, it has been, uh, so like the agenda we post yeah. does not have a call to order. So okay, great. It's not a meeting, but right. we would have like the, you know, who is gonna be the MC? We say introduction by so-and-so, right. okay. presentation by such and such, and then, you know, open discussion or uh, okay. kind of open-ended. Great questions about or thoughts about this proposed meeting on the 1st of May? Sharon. I actually had a question, Craig, about what you were just saying. So I love the idea of not limiting what the public says. That's awesome. It, give, it gives freedom. What I'm afraid of, though, is if there are no, if there are no boundaries and somebody walks up and says, hey, I want a water slide. Well, you've asked me for my idea. And, and then later they're told they can't have the water slide. I, I, I don't want to let people down. And so obviously a water slide is a bad example, but um, you know, so are there minimal uh, guidance we could give the public? Craig? Sure. Um, perhaps what we can do maybe is um, post some kind of open-ended questions. So by that, by that date, I can help you guys come up with some sort of thought provoking questions that will shape that conversation or shape the comments we're getting back. So we're not getting comments about water slide, you know, requests for kind of oddball things. So I just want to follow up on, uh, if I may, Craig, on the question that Sharon raised. And we talked about this in the outreach subcommittee. Alex will weigh in. There are certain things which are, if you will, more or less set in stone. Uh, for this project. There are things that we've committed to the MBLC to do. We, isn't it uh, fair to say that we want to be clear with the public about what those commitments are going into this conversation? In other words, it's not going to help us if someone says, well, I think the building should be half the size it is now. We've committed to certain things in the process of our conversation with the town council and with the voters, um, and it's probably not the case that someone's gonna say, well, I don't think we should be green. I think we shouldn't be doing this thing. We should just have fossil fuel. So isn't there some way to be clear with people, here's what the kind of givens are without constraining the, the conversation? Because I do worry that you're, if you don't remind people of what the givens are, you're inviting people to, weigh in on things which at the end of the day it you know we're happy to hear what people have to say but we're not going to be able to change significantly the footprint we're not going to be able to change significantly the program so isn't there isn't it possible and good to be clear with people going into the meeting just to remind them here here are the parameters within which we are with within which we are working i think that's a fair strategy um and then kind of sort of give them the, you know, those broad brush boundaries. Broad brush, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think that would be appropriate. And, uh, and I would recommend that. Alex? Yeah, so one of the things that we had talked about um, would be to have, you know, tables around the library, you know, each one sort of housing a program, right? Be it teens, ESL, whatever you know, would sort of define the programs that we have, but also having space for people to talk generally about, um, you know, valuing in, you know, the, the welcoming, you know, that the library is welcoming, um, you know, maybe there's a table around universal design, maybe there's a table around sustainability, maybe there's a table around, you know, historic preservation, um, which maybe is that more sort of open-ended piece um, to give people the opportunity to sort of talk about 
Um, or, or and, and maybe we just also have like a crazy idea board, right? Which is that, which is that unfettered, un right? Like throw it out. And, and, and if it's labeled as like the crazy idea board, I think then that in and of itself or whatever you call it, gives people the idea that, you know, maybe something will come out of this that will be amazing and we'll put it in the library, but this is, we're just asking people to, you know, put a wish list together and, and who knows what will come out of it. Maybe something, you know, that can be incorporated that we didn't think of previously, but makes total sense, you know. Paul. Yeah, I think it's a courtesy to the public to structure the areas where we are seeking feedback. And I think that people are feel their time is valued when you do that to say, we are looking at the teen room. We really want to have information about what you think would make a great teen room. We're not looking at these other, the, the water slide, but then at the end have something, the catch all things like the crazy idea board. I also, uh, Angela has pointed out that May 1st, there is the linguistic diversity day scheduled for the town common from two to five. And that's a big final celebration of, of linguistic heritage, heritage month. So when you start to start to pick dates, I encourage you to check with uh, our community participation officers to clear, or maybe it's a great thing. Maybe it's a good thing to coincide with, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, other thoughts about the possible meeting on the 1st of May? Alex? Yeah, I just want to follow. So you said that was two to five, Paul? So, Angela, do you have any thoughts? Um, like if ours is 11 to 12, is it good to give people sort of a lunch break and then on to the two to five? Or do we want them to be continued? Like what's a good way to take advantage of people already coming to town for that in terms of timing, if you have thoughts on that? It's a Katie Richardson event, um, so there will be food served on the common as part of the event. And in terms of timing, I think back to back is probably the best way to go because you don't want to bring the kids to town and then leave and then come back. Okay, so we'll check at the library if we can push ours back maybe to end at two or end at 1.30 maybe. And just again, to be clear, we, we hope that people will be able to attend, but if people on this committee are not able to attend, we'll, we, don't need a, we don't need a quorum because we're not gonna be doing any business. Okay. If no other thoughts on the meeting, I wanna come back to the question that Alex raised. So what are your thoughts the the Outreach Committee is asking for your thoughts about this charge. Do you want the Outreach Committee to just transmit all the things that the Outreach Committee collects to the Design Committee? Or was what's contemplated in this idea of making recommendations that you want the Outreach Committee to cull through those suggestions and do something with them before they hand them over to the Design Committee? What is What are people understanding? Stand about the charge. Sharon. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, so I was assuming they would just collect and send it to design um, only because the design in theory is going to have the, you know, the overarching vision, maybe. Okay. Other thoughts? Paul. So I would look for a more of a hybrid approach where the committee has its own interpretation of what was said, but then everything that was said is is conveyed, so nothing is lost, but that someone has sort of digested it partially. Thank you, Paul. Other thoughts? Christine, what do you think? Well, you're chair of the design committee, so it, it's kind of what will be most helpful. I'm not sure. Um, it depends. I, I heard Paul when he's like, so nothing is lost yet. I wouldn't want us to get weighed down in too many um, ideas and maybe they should be grouped somewhat um, into categories and types. Um, then maybe, I don't know, the FAA or the OPM can then give us guidance on which ones we can focus on and which ones are just not possible because at some point it has to go through that grinder that you're talking about you know what is possible what is not what costs a lot what doesn't and you know you can get caught up in those details and those weeds very easily so that's my biggest concern 
Alex, uh, this idea of a hybrid approach where you, the committee will transmit, here's, here's, here's the archive, so to speak, but here's the gloss on the archive from the outreach committee. And the outreach committee is not doing design work, right? The gloss would be as you know, we had nine meetings and these are the things that seem to be top of mind for uh, the, the people from we've, we've heard. Is, is that what we're talking about? That's the hybrid approach, Paul? Good. Okay, Alex, is that helpful? Yeah, if, if, if that's what people have settled on. Yeah, that's, that's great. Does anybody have an objection to that approach as an interpretation of the charge? Okay, I think we're, we're at it. A Alex? Yeah, and if I could make a request also. So I've, we, I've started compiling um, a list and Sharon's been sending me things as well. So Austin and Sharon had a, I don't, I don't think they're called Cup of Joes anymore, but with Paul and Brianna. And so, you know, I, took note of all the questions that were asked by the community and responses. Um, and then Sharon just recently had a meeting with the Historic Society. So I think to the extent that as committee members, you might be getting questions from the public or I think to the extent that, that they can all sort of be centralized so that the community outreach subcommittee is able to put together an FAQ or make sure that at meetings that we're addressing common questions that we're seeing, that would be great. Thank you for that suggestion. Christine. Uh, just one more thought. I, I think it's really great. The outreach is really trying to be aggressive and get this rolling because sort of doing that first collection and giving the public a couple opportunities to put all those crazy ideas like the water slide or whatever, um, get them sort of like in there now and, and start sort of sorting them and addressing them because, you know, We've been waiting for a long time, but then all of a sudden time is gonna speed up and all of a sudden we'll be like at construction documents. And when you're finishing with those and then someone says, we want the water slide, <laughs> it, it's kind of too late. Um, and that will end up happening more and more frequently as we roll through the process that just the design is you know, near done and you can't go back and change things. So um, anyways, the more we get of that in the neck over, you know, the next few months, I think is vital. So thank you, Outreach. Thank you, Christine. Sean. Alex may have said this, um, sorry, excuse me. Alex may have said this already or, um, or I may have missed it, but it might make sense to coordinate with the school's outreach as well, thinking about the school project and, um, they're, you know, the same group of people and, or a lot of them are the same group and, um, yeah, so just think about how they're doing their outreach and if there's ways to tag along on, onto those events or, right. or they tag along with us, right? There you so. go. There you go. Paul? And, and the outreach committee may have already done this, but the school building committee has set up and uh, they have the, the building project website, but they all have also have utilized the Engage Amherst page, which allows for a dialogue to happen with a person. So this library could out do that if they if they outreach committee could say let's look into that if they wanted to but that's you'd work through the CPOs and Brianna to set that page up. Thank you, Paul. Alex. Yeah, actually, Paul, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, um, for the for the separate so all of that that you just talked about would be set up through Brianna and not like I my understanding is that the OPMs for the school project, it's a little bit different structure because of what the MSBA requires. And so we're sort of trying to navigate what happens for the school project and what's within the budget proposal of the OPM um, and, and trying to sort of make sure we understand the difference in terms of what we're asking of whom and when it's appropriate. Because Ken and Craig don't work for free. So I wanna make sure that. <laughs> well, Craig does, but Ken doesn't. Okay. <laughs> So is it, is it, so what you're contemplating, Paul, is all being done by town, not by the OPM on the school project? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm in dangerous territory here because I'm volunteering at other people's <laughs> times. <laughs> so I would suggest that you talk to the CPOs and see what's what's possible. And that, that Engage Amherst site is managed by um, Brianna. Um, and then people put what happens with that. And Sean has done this with our budgets. Somebody own is there's a staff person who owns the page. And so when people pose questions, then they, they respond to them. 
And then there's an archive of all the questions so people can look at the sort of a self-developed FAQ in essence. Yeah, and in terms of timing, I think for the OPMs, someone would just have to compile the questions and then work with the OPMs to get to answer them, you know, to provide official answers. Um, somebody, we can manage the questions coming in. That, that part's not too hard. It would just be working with the OPMs to get the, you know, the responses that we want to put out there. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Okay, any other, Alex, are you, are you good? Okay. So if there are any other questions about outreach? So uh, I just want to say I'm grateful for the work that Alex has already has already done on outreach, the thoughtfulness already that the committee is subcommittee is shown. And I completely value uh, the, and recognize what Christine said, which is um, Alex's energy and commitment to getting out front on this outreach thing will pay dividends uh, in many, many, in many, many ways. So we're, we're grateful to Alex for that work and to uh, and to our other outreach subcommittee members. Okay, next item is correspondence. I think we have none. Next item is topics not anticipated by the chair at 48 hours in advance. Is there anything else that we haven't thought about that has come up? Okay, now is an opportunity for public comment. We have six attendees and we're grateful uh, for their uh, interest and their attendance. If they would signify uh, by raising their hand in the, in the, um, on the Zoom and uh, if they wanna make a comment or ask a question. I wanna say something that I said uh, with when Paul did the community chat. Um, this community is lucky to have so many people that love our library. And there were, there were differences in the vision about what that love should translate into. And we had a good and vigorous conversation over a long period of time. Incredibly grateful to everyone, including people who didn't share the particular vision that prevailed. What we want now is we want to bring the community together uh, to work to make the, this the best library it can be. And the tremendous energy and love that was shown by everybody on all sides, on both sides of this, we now hope to channel so that we are working together uh, to do what everybody wants to do, which is to have the best Jones Library that we can have. Okay, so, what I'd now like to do, and I'd like Paul to make the motion, is to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Good. Now let's vote. Paul, how do you vote? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Sharon. You're not supposed to be excited about saying goodbye to us. Yes. Sharon. Alex. Yes. Christine. Yes. Sean. Yes. George. Yes. And I really do want to thank the OPM. Uh, I want to thank Collier's Ken and his colleagues, Ken and Craig, for the great work you've done um, with FAA. Thank you for that. Thank you for all of your sage, um, for all of your sage advice. And I vote yes to adjourn. Stay safe, everybody. I'll see you next in two weeks. And Our next Johnny meeting is. And Johnny Bench's number was number five. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk more about that later. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank right. you, everybody. Thank you,